I'm very fond of Gerard Manley Hopkins' poetry, and particularly is one about the kingfishers, as kingfishers catch fire, how God is present, dragonflies draw flame as tumbled over rim in roundy wells, stones ring like each tucked string tells, each hung bell's bow swung finds tongue to fling out broad its name. Each mortal thing does one thing and the same, deals out that being indoors, each one dwells, selves, goes itself, myself, it speaks and spells, crying what I do is me for that I came. I say more, the just man justices, keeps grace, that keeps all his goings graces, acts in God's eye what in God's eye he is, Christ. For Christ plays in 10,000 places, lovely in limbs and lovely in eyes not his, to the Father, through the features of men's faces. It is a wonderful thing that Christ is doing. A wonderful thing. And I have a few things still to talk to you about. Um, one of the things that I want to talk to you about is the role of knowledge in the role of knowledge in making disciples, living together in Trinitarian fellowship, and teaching people to do everything Christ said. Now, it is very difficult to teach anyone if you don't have knowledge. And we are in a period where knowledge is not only underdone, but feared and opposed, as if it were an enemy of faith. But you need to think deeply about how you're going to do the work you contemplate to do as ministers of Christ, and how you're going to live your life if it is not on a basis of knowledge. The prophet Hosea does not say, my people perish for lack of faith, does he? He says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. A major defense of the secular world against the gospel is, well, we have knowledge, you have faith. Am I making any sense? You've run into this, haven't you? And that is a primary point upon which the gospel and the people of Christ must challenge its world today. So let's begin here just by making clear that these are different things, and then we'll talk about what they are briefly. Knowledge, belief, or faith, they're the same thing. Commitment, and profession. Those are different things. We tend to take people in on the basis of their profession. Isn't that right? Upon the profession of your faith, my brother, sister, in Christ, 
I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Profession. Well, maybe we'd better begin with knowledge and work down to that. But you will want to understand that if you're working in terms of this without the rest of it, you ain't got much. You may not even have commitment. And in fact, we're constantly struggling with commitment in our congregations. With having projects which our people are not committed to. Well, what are they committed to? It may be that they're not committed to much of anything. Or maybe they're committed to things that they don't really believe in. Hmm. That may explain why they're not committed. Or maybe they believe things, but it's not founded in knowledge. Now, biblical faith is always in an environment of knowledge, always. The idea which modern thought through a torturous process has saddled the church, that faith is a leap, is ridiculous. What they call a leap of faith is a leap without faith. And you always find that out when you listen to them a little bit. Faith leaps on a basis of knowledge. That's how faith leaps. Abraham in faith went out not knowing where he was going. But he did that on the basis of his knowledge that God was with him. Am I making any sense? Okay. Now you watch the biblical record and you'll see that that is always the case. There are no leaps of faith. Job exercised faith of immense proportions, but it was on the basis of his knowledge. And we have to, in our day, really deal with this or you cannot make disciples. Upon what basis would you make a disciple? If it isn't knowledge. Now the standard way, I think, that people manage to stand up in the pulpit and proclaim, hoping that something will happen, is they believe that if they say the words in faith, God will strike people with lightning. And the miracle of faith will happen. Now, God does strike people with lightning, and miracles of faith do happen. But that is not the general context out of which one speaks and lives as a Christian, and especially not as a disciple of Christ. It's on the basis of what you know that you act, and when you act, sometimes in faith, your experience gives more knowledge and more faith. And that is the natural progression. Yes. How do you get it? How do you get faith as a gift? Without knowledge? With knowledge. Is knowledge ever more miraculous in its own right? Do you, you strike one of the issues. Faith is a gift. Knowledge is a what? Work. Knowledge is human, faith is divine. Right? 
knowledge can come by gift and miracle as much as faith. What Paul is saying in that passage is you are dead in trespasses and in sins and your coming to faith comes as a miracle. But now what is missing here? If you want faith, can you do anything about it? How does faith come? Faith comes by the Word of God. Now, is that knowledge or what is it? No. Uh, this is such a big deal. I just encourage you to take your concordance and do inductive Bible study on knowledge. Know, the word know. And see how often that occurs. Especially in relationship to what God does. And how many times it is said, I am doing this in order that you may know. Okay, now I'm, I'm hoping I've got your concept stirred up a little bit here, so let's pursue this. By the way, is there anyone here who knows anything? Good. I feel better already. If you don't, should you leave? Be my guest. The academic context has a vested interest in making people skeptics. But no one lives as a skeptic, including the people in the academic context. But a part of the human project is to undermine knowledge, especially of things that matter in human life, so that the Word of God cannot have effect in human life. Uh, we have the thing in this country called the separation of church and state. Upon what assumption would you say that, is, that separation is made? What, you, can you imagine anyone talking about the separation of state and chemistry? Now, there are social and political reasons for not having an establishment of religion. But that's not what, what, what we're talking about when we talk about separation of church and state. When people generally speak of separation of church and state, they are assuming that the church doesn't know anything important. It is predicated on the assumption that what the church teaches is not knowledge of reality. You know something if you are able to represent it as it is on an appropriate basis of thought and experience. Knowledge is not just being right. Knowledge has a foundation in evidence and method. When someone says they know something, they have stepped into the public arena because that bears the claim of truth and method. Knowledge requires method and knowledge requires truth. Now that's what you want in your dentist, don't you? You'd like them to know something. You wouldn't take your car to a shop that said we're lucky at making repairs. <laughs> you want them to know something. Often they are lucky and sometimes unlucky, but that's not what you go there for. You want people who know in this sense. This is what knowledge is. Now you need to understand that, folks, because the confusion about it is what 
the resistance to the gospel thrives on. I say, well, you know, if it's not knowledge, well, you can just take it or leave it. It's just belief, just faith. Now, a belief, idea, statement, proposition, or whatever is true, if what it is about is as it is represented in the belief. You believe you have a dime in your pocket. The belief is true if you have a dime in your pocket. Now, beliefs can be true without constituting knowledge. You pick up beliefs by the people you're with. Little children come to believe most of the things they believe just because the people around them believe. That's a good thing. You wouldn't want them to have to wait until they could know. And we arrive at maturity with a set of beliefs that we picked up and then a large part of our responsibility is to sort those out and to find which ones are true and which ones are false. We learn things like, well, it wasn't true just because my folks believed it. Belief never makes truth. Never makes truth. Truth is not relative. Belief is relative. A proposition or belief isn't true because you believe it. It's true because what it's about is as it says. That's true. And you can't make anything true by believing it. You can make something believed by believing it. So when you hear some way, someone say, well, it's true for me and false for you. No. They've already missed, they don't know what truth is. It's believed by me and disbelieved by you. Okay. Because belief is relative. Truth is not. And you can't make anything true by believing it. You uh, just try. Try to do it. Okay, now. Knowledge is the environment of belief. And when you're going to make disciples, I hope you won't go with the attitude that you're going to say some words and God is going to hit them. It won't work. There are occurrences where something like that happens, but you cannot adopt it as your modus operandi. I will say the words and God will hit them. Many people actually believe that. That's where they take on that passage in 1 Corinthians 1 where Paul is talking about the foolishness of preaching. Preaching is only foolish in comparison to what the Jews and the Greeks thought was the way you're supposed to proceed. And in any case, it doesn't say the foolishness of the preacher. Preaching as a technique, declaring, pronouncing, we talked about that briefly, is a way of bringing truth to people, and God does interact with that. What I'm saying to you is don't adopt that as your modus operandi. Bring knowledge of Christ to people. Bring knowledge of Christ to people. That means you have to have it first. And if you have it, it will come to people in a very different way. Because knowledge is a totally different kind of thing from belief. If you bring knowledge to people, you are coming to them as someone who has the right and responsibility to act. That's what knowledge does. Knowledge brings you the right and responsibility to act. Belief does not. 
If you believe that tooth is rotten, but don't know, and you're a dentist, you do not have the right to start to work on it. <clears throat> if you know that it is, you have the responsibility as well as the right to start to work on it. <clears throat> so knowledge brings the right to act, the right to direct action, to formulate policy and supervise it, and to teach. Only knowledge brings those things. The right to act, the right to direct action, the right to formulate policy and to supervise it, and the right to teach. Now, may I say to you, that that's why you're in school. You are not in school to get faith. Do you agree with me about that? You're not in school to get faith. You're in school to get knowledge. Now, if the Christian teaching is not knowledge, what are you getting? Hmm? <laughs> well, tradition maybe. You're learning how to be good. You fill in the blank. Then you go out, you're trained to act like a good... <coughs> so that happens. Not everything that people think is knowledge is knowledge. You can think you know and you don't. That's common occurrence. So you have to be careful. But I think probably if you all became convinced that you were not gaining a body of knowledge that authorized you to act, to direct action, to formulate and supervise policy and teach, I think you'd drop out. Now some of you might say, well, no, but I want my credentials. <clears throat> See, And credentials don't necessarily represent knowledge. You can be credentialed and have a thing and sign on your, on your wall that says, I'm Mr. Goodrich because I've gone to school and still not be able to fix cars. Credentialing is one thing, enablement is another. Now I'm dragging you through this because this is absolutely essential to making disciples. You have to have decided that you are dealing with knowledge. What about belief? You're dealing with belief also. But remember, you believe something when you are prepared to act as if it were so, but it may not be so. Belief can be totally ungrounded, irrational, or false, and no less belief for that. And now you may think that God will really like you if you would act as if you believe something when you don't. A lot of people are acting as if they believe things. That's profession and maybe a little commitment, but they don't believe it. Now let me some, say something really mean, and that is when we get up to preach on Sunday morning, we're basically facing a wall of unbelief. And that's why people don't act as if what they say they believe is true. Now this is not something to harass people with. It's something to try to help people to understand. Many people have trouble with belief because they don't believe, they profess. And professing things does not have the effects of belief. And you need your belief to be environed in knowledge so that your belief is steady and established. 
because it's based on knowledge and continuing experience. Now I've talked about a lot of different things here that cause us problems in progressing towards holiness and enabling those we teach to make progress in obedience to Christ. But one of the most severe problems is we're not operating on the basis of knowledge. And our beliefs are wavering and we realize that some person that's been involved in our church, maybe even a, a minister for years may show up one day and or not show up one day. And then we may say, well, what happened? That's appropriate. And we need to follow and find out. But you can guarantee it was not something that happened that day, but what had been going on all along. They were not solid. They were not operating on the basis of knowledge. So you believe something when you are prepared to act as if it were so. And if that belief is solid and it's true, you're on good ground. You can almost say it doesn't matter whether you know or not. The problem is you can rarely get there with belief and it, unless it's founded in knowledge. See, that's why it's important not just to believe that Jesus rose from the dead, but to know it. That's why it's important not just to believe that God exists and created the world, but to know it. And now that drives you back and look at knowledge and you work on it. You say, well, maybe you don't know it. Could you know it if you wanted to? Are you willing to pay the price to know? The knowledge is like that. It doesn't jump down our throats. If you want knowledge, you have to seek knowledge. You have to do things like pay a lot of money and read a lot of books and sit around and hear a lot of people talk. Right. Knowledge doesn't jump down your throat, and if you don't want it, you don't have to have it. You can reject the knowledge, and if it's getting, getting in the way of your kingdom, you probably will. That's why people fear knowledge today and don't want to hear people say they know, because if they do know, that has a claim that if they say, well, I believe, it doesn't have. What part does experience play in knowledge? Confirms knowledge, advances it, right? I mean, that's, that's we, we, learn, we know most of the things we know on authority. For example, you all know the multiplication tables. You do. But you know them on authority. And you do know them. But it's rare to find anyone that has worked out the multiplication tables by experience to find out that even three times eight equals 24. If, if you know it, but haven't experienced it, how, how solid is it? Well, yeah, you, there's no, one of the problems is that people try to give completely general answers to those kinds of questions. And we know that pe some people know some things better than other people do. And then some people don't know them at all. Typically what happens with the learning process is you have some people who know things and others who don't, maybe they just believe them, and then as they proceed, the people who didn't know them come to know them. Commitment, choosing and implementing a course of action. You can commit yourself to something you don't even believe in. If you're in the woods and lost, you may not know which way to go. But after a while, you will decide you'd better go somewhere. And you will commit yourself to a direction and try to hold to it. And that's one of the things that human beings can do. We can extend our action beyond our belief just like we can extend our belief beyond our, act, our knowledge. And all of that's extremely important because of the context of finitude that we work in. So we start out with beliefs, uh, we come to knowledge of certain things, then 
Uh, we can test our beliefs by experience in some cases. In some cases, it isn't exactly experience, maybe thought, or logically weighing them against other things that we know. So that's how, that's what we generally do in school. But profession is saying that you believe something. You may believe it and profess it. That's good. Or you may not even be committed to it and still profess it. So you need these four concepts, knowledge, belief, commitment, profession. And you need to understand where you, where you stand, where I stand, and then you need to help others deal with that. And what you're aiming for in making disciples and in guiding them is that fundamentally everything would be based on knowledge as much as it can. Now, again, you don't have to know in order to believe. There are a lot of things you better believe even if you can't know them. God is at work in all of these areas, not just in one of them. Knowledge has drawbacks. Paul talks about these. The two main drawback, drawbacks is you never know anything as well as you could. Right? You never know anything as well as you could. If anyone thinks he knows something, Paul says, they don't know anything the way they ought to know. And that is to help you not get carried away with arrogance. Because knowledge has a tendency to do that. You tell a little child who's just learned to talk something they did not know, and they are most likely to say, I know. You test it. Now that's because knowledge is a really big thing in the substance of the self. To not know is to be left out. To know is to be in. Everyone wants to be in. So Paul teaches us we never know things as well as we could. He also tells us that knowledge puffs up. Love builds up. Knowledge puffs up. So should we throw away knowledge? No. We should subordinate knowledge to love. Always. Knowledge subordinate to love. Don't let it puff you up. And it'll help you to remember that you never know anything as well as you might. So we have to keep it in its place. And it is among the things that 1 Corinthians 13 t tells us it will pass away because it will pass into sight. And one of the great things about knowledge, of course, is it enables you to do things with realities that you don't see. Truth is designed by God to help us negotiate reality. If you have true beliefs and your wits are about you, you will be able to negotiate reality well, as far as it's <laughs> dealt with by that belief. Now, um, knowledge is important. So if we're going to make disciples, we want to make sure that insofar as we can, we're basing it on knowledge. And that we present the way of Christ to people, the preaching of the kingdom of God and all of that, we present it to people as knowledge of reality. Knowledge of reality. And good. Right. You can take that all the way back up that way. Yep. 
See, profession ha is often done to, man to manage our kingdom. And sometimes it's deadly serious because if you don't profess something, someone may kill you or deprive you of your job and your opportunities. See, that has happened over and over, right? And that's one reason why profession has come to play such a large role in Western religion, but it actually plays a large role in all religion. So people may profess things that they don't believe, nobody knows, and they're not committed to. And that's why I gave you those four things. I want you to see how it changes as you go up. Right. Now, there, a lot of this I don't want to get into, but you want to think thoughts like this. You can actually not believe some things you know. Because belief involves the will. You believe something, you're ready to act as if it were true. Typical case of, of a person who, as we used to say, is under conviction. They know something they don't believe. That's why they're convicts. They're captured. They know something that they don't believe. Now, it may be they're just persuaded of something, but they don't want to believe it, and so they reject it. And you can analyze that in terms of William James. Because the tension that is set up by that conflict is where a person who is under conviction is living. That's, that's what was happening with St. Augustine, if you know his story. He was sweating under conviction because he had met some people and learned about some people and he was just out practically out of his wits. That's what happened to Paul on the road to Damascus. So we can believe things that we don't know and we can know things that we don't believe. For example, the people who were watching the game last night and were pulling for Texas were in a period where they knew something that they didn't believe. <laughs> you know? A person who gambles is typically a person who knows something they don't believe. They know they're not going to win, but they believe they are. So that's just, I'm, I have hardly begun, okay? My only reason for doing this is I want you to know the difference before those four things and the effect they have on making disciples and on spiritual growth. It's important for you to think the thought that in your program with Howard and your school, that what you are receiving about spiritual formation and so on, at least is potential knowledge. It's potential knowledge. You don't have to have it, but you could have it. And if you did have it, then it would change your whole approach to spiritual formation. Okay, now I want to talk about teaching someone to do what Jesus said. Hey, we're doing pretty well. Yes, it did. That helped a lot. Okay, now we're going to talk about teaching someone to do what Jesus said. And you have to think in two contexts. One is you're one-on-one -on -one with someone. And very often that's the only way you can approach it because the other way is where you are in a program in a church or religious group teaching people how to do what Jesus said. These are very different contexts, and by far, the second 
is the one that is intended by Christ and is best for teaching people to do what he said. That is the context where you have a group. And ideally this would be a group that is under a ministry of preaching and teaching and example that is committed to spiritual formation in discipleship. And by the way, the difference between those is discipleship is a status and spiritual formation is the process that you undergo in that status. You become a disciple by committing yourself to Jesus Christ as your Lord, Master, and Teacher and throwing your crown at His feet. And you may, in that position, be very green. Disciples are often very green. Discipleship is not an advanced spiritual position. But it's a hopeful one. Because now you are, as it were, signed up for the course. And things can begin to move. And that's intended to be a communal thing. It isn't intended to be just an individual on their own. But in many circumstances you're in, you may have to do it with individuals, and it can be done. Now, if you're starting one, you might try that. Start it on the basis of discipleship. But if it's not started on that basis, you're going to have a hard time turning it around. And people are going to be mad at you if you try. Of course, that's not the end of the world. But you need to expect it and not say, well, I thought I was doing something good. I thought everyone would just get up and say, whoopee, let's do it. They won't. But in any case, those are the two contexts. And I want to say something relevant to both of them. Okay? So now, let's, let's put a few things in order. In order to teach someone to do what Jesus said, they have to be disciples. So, okay, disciples made. So if you're going to teach people to do what Jesus says, they have to be disciples, and someone has to make them. Now, do you have clearly fixed in your mind how you would help someone become a disciple? We must go slow here. And I, I don't mean to push anything on you in answer to that question or expect you to give an answer to it right now. But if you're going to teach people to do what Jesus said, they must be disciples. And if they're disciples, they must have become disciples. So now how did they become a disciple? You know, it's possible that Jesus met them. There are all sorts of ways that could happen. But is there a way that we could make a steady part of our operation? So let's take a few moments here now. How would you know a disciple if you met one? Trying to follow Jesus. Hmm? They're trying to follow Jesus. Would that be enough? They're trying to follow Jesus. Don't we have to go a little more into the details of what that means? No, don't assume what I didn't say isn't included. In <laughs> but I'm trying, to got, I'm trying to get you to say what you didn't say. Okay. So what, what was it you didn't say? We have people all, you know, every week stand up and say, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. 
What's on their mind? They have to have knowledge of who they're following. Ah. So they would have to know something about what following Jesus involved. Hmm? And they would have had to decide to take that on. Now compare it to being a disciple in other contexts. Let us suppose that you've decided to learn French and you now have selected a teacher. What have you decided to do with reference to that teacher? Sorry? Pretty good. Is that in what you didn't say? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Now, I, I like to try to put that by saying, I'm going to be with them, learning to be like them. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to my French teacher. I'm going to be with them. Now, of course, today we can use tapes and all sorts of things. But basically, when you are a disciple of someone, you are with them, learning to be like them. Now, in this case, it's a certain respect, like them in their capacity to speak French. A child in third grade is with their teacher, learning to be like them in their capacity, for example, to multiply and divide numbers. They're taking on the character of the teacher in that respect. So now, maybe we could identify a disciple of Jesus as someone who has decided to be with them, learning to be like them. They've decided to do that, and they are arranging and rearranging their affairs to make that happen. So let's, let's add that on now, okay? They've decided, they, they've decided, I'm going to be with them, learn to be like them, and I'm going to arrange my affairs to do that. Simple cases, I, I show up for class. Yes? Not just be with them, but be attentive to them. You're going to have to be attentive to them if you're going to learn to be like them, aren't you? You don't sleep through class. You do the exercises. So this will become more and more specific. Now we have to pause over this and make sure we got something. A disciple of Jesus is someone who has decided to be with them, with Jesus, learn to be like him. That means they are arranging their affairs so that will happen uh, all the way down to paying attention. And uh, if you see someone like that, you're looking at a disciple of Jesus. Now, how could you get someone to do that? Well, that's where you have to go back to the vision model, uh, the VIM model. You only make disciples in the light of a vision. A person who is going to disciple themselves to someone to learn French. There's going to be someone who is convinced it would be wonderful to speak French. So the vision here is the gospel. And for a moment we can stop there and go back and realize, well, which gospel? We want a gospel that will provide a basis for making disciples. Okay. of life now in heaven with Jesus. Life now in heaven 
with Jesus. If you want to go to heaven, don't wait. Go now. And if you do, then it will turn out you never die. We've got to make sense of that somehow. So in the context of uh, teaching people do what Jesus said in mm -hmm. the setting that we're talking about, we need to uh, first assume that they are disciples, which on the them pattern... Would be That's why we're starting here, yes. It would, it would be, I'm asking if they would have the vision and the intention, and now we're discipling them in the means? Absolutely or? right. Okay. And this is why, because you can't go down that road if you don't start here. And this is messy. This is a messy business because people hear so many things. And this is going to take a lot of straightening out in most people's minds in our culture because what they've, they've heard as the message of the church... <laughs> God only knows. Because it isn't just a function of what was said, it's a function of how they heard it. And uh, you, in, Jesus, in the Gospels, you know, Jesus had a constant problem with people who heard a message and got whoopied up, and, but they weren't on for what it was really about. And you know how that causes prob caused problems over and over. It's one reason why he would say when he'd heal someone very often, don't tell anyone. Because he knew that they would take that wrongly. Because what they had in their heads was something about the kingdom of God and the Messiah that was false. And it wasn't just people wandering the streets. I mean, he had the trouble with his own apostles to get that straight. And then he had problems when he fed people with getting them to understand that it wasn't just about bread. Labor not for the meat that perishes, he said them, but for the meat that lasts unto everlasting life. And so this is, this is really a, a difficulty. Now, look, we don't have to be perfect in any of this. We don't have to have it all perfectly straight, but we have to have enough of it that will allow us to make enough of an intention to start seriously practicing being with Jesus, learning to be like Him. That's the focus, okay? That's the focus of the disciple. And I really want to emphasize, because so often we get stuck on getting it all just right. You don't have to have it all just right to be a follower of Jesus. Your intentions do not have to be perfect. Not required. But there has to be enough substance at both of those levels that will enable us to arrange our life to become like Him. something. I know a lot of the, the gospel of like the prosperity gospel does concentrate on what God is doing now and not just when you get to heaven. Mm -hmm. But what emphasis is going wrong there uh, in, the, in that gospel? What's wrong with that gospel is it really says nothing at all about becoming like him. Now that's not fair to some people who preach it, but generally speaking that's the tendency. That's exactly the response of the people around Jesus in his day. You could get elected real quickly if you could turn a few biscuits into a bunch of bread. And they almost, they came to make him king by force. Yeah. Nothing wrong with prosperity. But if that becomes what is at the center 
of your hopes, you're on the wrong train. Yes. <clears throat> to connect what we started with this hour, um, a disciple is someone who has knowledge, belief, commitment, and profession. No, 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 no. Wait, 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 wait. You, I want you to fit those together, but you're apt to start a way up the line from where discipleship begins, if you aren't careful with that. Now, what I'm saying to you is this. If you're going to make disciples, please operate out of knowledge in doing so. That will involve belief also, some commitment and profession. But you do need to have knowledge as a basis for you making disciples. And that it will involve you communicating knowledge to the individual. And that will be partly miraculous, and it will be partly because you've worked real hard to be able to present that to people as knowledge. In the corner and then next. I have a real hard time hearing out of that corner. At what point does the surrender of the will, your will not mine, your kingdom not my kingdom, at what point does that happen? It happens, it happens when you become a disciple. You cannot become a disciple unless you do that. Now later you will find out that you, did, you had no understanding of what it meant. <laughs> So that's where you remember, discipleship is a status. Now, and thank you for asking the question. This is why Jesus says, if you don't hate your mother and your father and blah, 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 in your own life also, if you don't take your cross daily and follow, you cannot be my disciple. That's very important to understand. But now then you understand that discipleship, as I say, is a status in which the process of spiritual formation occurs. And that's going to mean that you will be led into dimensions of surrender of your will that you had never even thought about. And God in His mercy tempers the wind to the shorn lamb, as we used to say, and doesn't just dump it on you all at once. But there has to be a decision. I will do what Jesus says. And that's why we need to be very clear about the vision underlying it. It has to include that. The lady next to you and then this gentleman here. Go ahead, Go ahead gentleman here. I was going to comment. Um, it's a lot like marriage in that sense then where you're making this commitment. <laughs> yes. Really yes. So. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very good. Very good. Yes, absolutely right. And really, any serious commitment. You know, would you commit yourself to a degree program if you really knew what it was going to involve? <laughs> See? So you step in, and grace helps you step in, and then grace is with you as you go along. And that's how it works. Great. Yes. Yesterday or the day before, you mentioned that uh, not all Christians are disciples. And I'm having a hard time with that. Haven't you known some that weren't disciples? I would say if they're not a disciple, they're not a disciple. Okay. So I would say don't say that too loudly or you're going to have a bunch of people on top of you like that. Now, why can't you make that judgment? I can't look into their heart. You can't tell whether or not a person is a disciple? Okay, let's go. Now, what is a disciple? A disciple is of someone, is someone who's decided to be with a person, learning to be like them. Could you tell whether or not someone is, was a disciple of a French teacher? Could you tell that? 
suppose they suppose they uh, never go near them don't listen to them don't practice what they say practice and so forth would you say they are not disciples of the French teacher now I appreciate your sensitivity but one of the things you have to do to help people is to make a judgment many people are disappointed in the Christian life because they are expecting from it what only comes to a disciple and they're not a disciple Uh oh. They may be living in a place of commitment. Okay. Right. And so that's the only way I am able to make a judgment of faith based on what is seen by observing them. Mm -hmm. For me to be able to look and to peer into their heart is another issue. So okay. I, I, I take it, I'm careful. Well, I just <laughs> leave it. I appreciate your sensitivity yeah. and just leave it with you. Um, I understand what you're saying. We can't look at the heart. Man looks on outward appearance. God looks on the heart. In a position of leadership, you are apt to have to decide whether or not a particular individual is a disciple or not. The consequences of being a disciple are different from the consequences of being someone who is committed or professing. The consequences are different. Yes. I'm just wondering if in theory then you cannot have a bad disciple. You can have very bad disciples. Jesus had crowds <laughs> of bad disciples. But then in, in a sense they weren't really intending to look like them. No, you have to add the time factor in there. Whether they become not bad disciples depends on what they do. So, a disciple, as I said, can be a very green disciple. Peter was a very green disciple. Jesus even called him Satan. Now, see, we're in in our concerns today. We're absolutely well. Suppose he had died right then, would he have gone to heaven? See, we tend to think of Christian as someone who's going to go to heaven when they die. Mm -hmm. Well, and those disciples did end up progressing beyond that. They did, they did pretty well, didn't they? Yeah. They did pretty well. Yeah. It's a great study to study as best we know what happened to them. Mm -hmm. There's a wonderful old book by A.B. Bruce called The Training of the Twelve. Mm -hmm. It's a wonderful book because it talks about who these guys were. And they were not beggars off the street. They were not debauched souls. They were solid citizens. Mm -hmm. But they had none of the advantages that people thought religious leaders should have. And a great old text is from Acts 4. The leaders got Peter and John up there and giving them the business, and it says, because they, they, as it says, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They sure weren't acting like it. And so they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. You could preach that. Now, that's one of the things I bound to run out of time. When we think about the church, the local congregation, we want to think of it as a hospital. And you've got some people being dragged in and put in ICU, others operated on emergency, some people getting up and walking down the halls, others rolling out in a wheelchair. That's the church. And if it's a church where there's discipleship, not all the niceties, don't worry about that. That's okay. That's good. That's the way it should be. That's the way it should be. Jake. Um, 
two questions. I wonder if you could just finish that thought. You said we tend to think Christians are people that are going to heaven. That well, I'm just saying. I think that's normally what people think. And then they have to decide that whether or not they're going to do that. Okay. And secondly, um, I think that a lot of our culture we look at the Jesus teachings on judgment. Mm -hmm. like that, totally in the wrong way. It's like, I mean, there's there's multitudes of different ways people people take that. Um, I was wondering if you could maybe clarify what in that particular the saying: "Do not judge, lest you be judged." Okay. Well, let me refer you to chapter 7 of the Divine Conspiracy, but talk about it a bit. What Jesus says is, don't get in the condemning game. In Matthew chapter 7, he's talking about what I call condemnation engineering. And that is, give the holy stuff to them in a way that will make it clear to everyone that they are worthless. And then you do that and they'll give it right back to you, which is exactly what happens. So get out of the condemning game. Judgment, unfortunately, has two meanings. One is discernment and the other is condemning. And we have managed by a clever perversion of Jesus' teaching in our culture to turn discernment into condemning so that we, condemning, we can condemn the person who is making a judgment about us. And that supposedly will shut them up. But that's a perversion. Jesus is not talking about discerning in Matthew 7. He's talking about condemning. He's talking about people who try to help people by condemning them. That's a human trait. Just condemn them, make them feel guilty, worthless. That'll motivate them to do what we know they ought to do. So that, those verses that open chapter 7 in Matthew are about engaging, indulging in condemnation. There are many ways of doing it. One is to give them really good stuff that won't help them. And then say, well, you're worthless. Because I gave you this and it didn't help you. The dog was hungry and I offered it a Bible. And the dog didn't eat it. It was still hungry. I had pearls. And I took them out and put them in the trough for the hogs. And the hogs didn't eat them. And then one day I stepped in there to give them another bucket of my pearls. And they saw something edible. <laughs> it was my leg. <laughs> Jesus is teaching us in that passage, don't get into condemnation. Don't go there. Don't even get into it in the way of giving your precious pearls to people who can't use them. Hmm. Okay? Good, you can't make disciples or help them by condemning them. Condemnation engineering, you want to take that out of your repertoire. Okay, now this is really important because unless you get these established, you can't go anywhere with teaching people how to do what Jesus said. Once you have got a student with a vision who really does believe this would be a wonderful thing, then you can begin to teach them. You need to start with where they are and what they're concerned with. Now this could be uh, anger. That's a good place to start. Contempt. You have a man who means well, 
but he cannot keep from yelling at his son. That'd be a good place to start, wouldn't it? Very likely, if he is a Christian, he thinks he ought not to do it. But that child is so exasperating, so stupid, and really wants to hurt me. And after about two moves in a conversation, I suddenly hear the volume has gone up. And the more it goes up, the more I'm locked into it. Actually, that's a typical progression in anger and dealing with others in anger and then they deal with you in anger and there you go. It's one of Jesus' standard lessons about how interactions develop. So now, you have a man here uh, who wants to learn something. Can you teach him? No. One of the things you can say, well, we have a counseling department in the church. And that's not bad, because what has actually happened is Christian counselors have been forced to take up the slack that is left in a situation where the ordinary course of events is not teaching people to do the things that Jesus said. And uh, it's not an altogether bad thing by any means. A lot of good is in it. Uh, but it does depend on whether or not the counselor is going to be able to help them or um, and how they help them. Uh, and in particular, whether or not the person will be able to learn how to do the th not do the things that are causing him trouble and to do the things in the absence of which are causing him trouble. So, have you got a way now of teaching someone not to be angry? That's the general idea of Jesus' teaching. Uh, so now, what are you going to do with him? The first thing you're going to do with him is help him to understand what anger is. That's the first thing you're going to do with him. And actually for some people that will be enough. Because a lot depends on the individual, but many individuals are well enough put together in the grace of God and in their general health that once they see what anger is, they will drop it like you drop a hot poker. They'll drop it. Now, there will be others who will not want to give up on anger. And they may want to say, well, you know, it's really righteous indignation. Mm -hmm. And then you have to go into that. Your teaching now is a really important part of this. Whether it's lusting, anger, using language to say a yes, that is no, or any of those things. The, the absolutely next stage after this is to help them understand what it is. Now, if you've got a group, and I, I would work for that, and it's possible, especially if the pulpit is teaching about this. Not, it's not always the case, because you may have the preaching pastor who's not on board for any of this. He's got something laid out, he or she does, and they, they've been doing that for decades, and they're not going to do this. But if you've got a pastor who's on board, then they can teach about anger. They can teach about lusting. They can teach about all of these things that Jesus refers to and help people make a start. And then they could say something like this. They could say, we're going to have a 
eight-week, three-month course on how to deal, how to not be angry. I would put it that way, not in anger management. All right. Okay, that's... I'm not knocking that, I'm just saying that's not what actually... You're not going to be doing the thing that you would be doing in a course that would be recognized as a course on anger management. You'd be doing some of the things, but not all of them. So you have... So you say, we're going to have a, a course. Who would like... There's a limited number of places and it should be limited. You don't want these kinds of things to get over more than six or eight people because you, there's going to have to be real individual attention to these people. And you say now, following up on Jesus' suggestion that we teach people to do everything he said, we're going to have a course or seminar for eight weeks, three week, three months, or something like that. Make sure it's not too long and not too short. You'll have to make a judgment about that. And if you take this at the end of it, you will no longer be unable to not be angry. Where you are now unable to not be angry. And the most important place for this application is in the family. Now this won't solve everybody's problems or anybody's, all of their problems. You focus it on the one thing. So then you begin, uh, you get your six or eight people and you begin to meet with them. And the first meeting I would devote to further explanations or explorations of what it is that they would like to stop, whether it's pornography or um, a certain way of conducting their business or whatever it is. You want it focused and say at the end of this period, you will be able, in brief, you will be able to do what Jesus said in this particular area. Okay? So that's the next stage now after explaining, helping them understand what anger or so forth is, is you get them together in a group, you try to help them make clear that they understand what, what it is. Now then, uh, you send them out for a week to identify anger. Uh, maybe if you, if you like the specific form of cursing and blessing, bless those who curse you, you have them observe cases of anger to just watch how it works doesn't need to be in them, they can do that, but watch it in other people. Come to know how anger actually works in real life. And uh, then you may want to take a couple of weeks at that. They come back, you have discussions, all of this of course you're prayerful and thoughtful. You're expecting the Holy Spirit to work in it. Uh, but we're just talking about the human side of it now. So you have them come back and you have them talk about the cases. You really want to get the stuff in front of them where they see it. And then when you feel like you have got them clear on that, you begin to deal with the roots of anger. Why do people get angry? Start with the cases. Here's a case. Someone's driving down the freeway. And someone cuts in front of them. And now a little festival of finger flicking breaks out. <laughs> Why? Why? What made that happen? 
And you see, you can only proceed beyond this by identifying the causes. You identify the causes and you deal with the causes and that's what allows you to step free of anger. That's true of pornography. That's true of any of these things that people tend to just get so hung up on and so beat up on that they feel like they can't make progress. So that next stage, after understanding, is looking at the causes, the roots of it. People don't get mad for nothing. It doesn't light on their head like a bird. It comes from somewhere. Where did it come from? And that's where they will be able to identify something probably much broader than just the issue they're dealing with. Because you see, you have individuals who practically undergo a personality transformation when they get in a car. What's that tied to? It's tied to increased power. So that when they are crossed, their will is crossed, there is in them a greater reaction. Now then you may want to talk about advertisements for automobiles at that point. How do people sell automobiles? What do they appeal to in selling an automobile? Power. Power. And that is ego stuff, isn't it? Where egos I go. Mm -hmm. Power enhances ego. Ego is about kingdom. It's about ruling. It's about reigning. It's about having my way. And seriously, I mean, you can take a, a week or two and just have people look at advertisements for automobiles because that's directly related to anger in driving. Directly. Now then, the next stage would be to get them to thinking about why do I need that? Why do I need that? Because it's rooted in their need. Why do I need to have my way? And now we, at last we are to the root of the problem. And if you can turn that so that a person, not only in their head, but in their body, doesn't have to have their way, you will have cut the roots of anger. And now you have to deal with issues like, well, but if I'm not mad, people will just run over me. There are other ways of handling that. You have to re-educate some people. And if the other guy in the car starts the finger flicking, you don't, you just wave that on because you're probably not going to be able to do anything about him unless you run into him and have to spend some time with him. <laughs> you know? So, but really we do have to re-educate people. We have to leave, leave time for that. Because if they are used to running more or less with anger, then they will run without it. And they will think that if you don't get mad, you don't mean what you say. They will think if you don't get mad, maybe they're going to get to have their way. But those are different issues. Now, if you're dealing with pornography, you've got different sets of issues at that level. Like, for example, how am I going to manage to have enough joy in my life if I don't do this? And that is answered by a different route in terms of the kingdom of God and your life in the kingdom of God. Take some instruction, 
but it can be answered. Okay, so now that's sort of the way you go with training. If you have to do it with an individual, it's a little more difficult. I think it takes longer, but it still can be done. You always have to start with this, individual or not. But I have, I have watched it. I've seen it for years. It works. It can be done. You don't have to have a list of things like I went through because a lot of it will be taken care of by the intelligence and grace in the individual that's doing it. Basically, for many people, serious, mature Christians especially, as we would understand that, taking allowance for the fact that they may not have been disciples, um, they tend to move quite quickly. And very often it's simply a matter of saying, you know, there's a way you can do this. Would you like to be rid of that? Or would you like to be able to do that? Yes, I just didn't know you could. Right? And once you say, make sense of that, give them a little progress, they take off. And they come to the place to where the things that used to tie them in knots or send them off like a rocket, they simply look at it and say, who needs that? Who needs that? Walk by the pornography on the 7-Eleven shelf and say, who needs that? Look at the donut and say, who needs it? Not defiantly, you know, not whistling in the dark. They really realize they don't need it because they've got something else. And then you've got a person who will easily and routinely do the thing that Jesus said. Now, just this one other point, we'll take a little break. You don't have to teach them everything that Jesus said. By the time you've done two or three, they will have gotten the idea and the heart of their difficulties would have been broken, and they'll do the rest. They need a little instruction, a little help from time to time. That should be ongoing, especially in a community of believers, and I know this is an ideal situation, and then we'll talk a little more about this after the break. That's why when you come to the Sermon on the Mount and the Sermon on the Plains, Matthew 5 through 7 and Luke 6, they don't say the same thing. Now that's a dead giveaway. That is not law. When you do law, you say the same thing. Go to law school and find out what it means. Now, you may purposefully try to develop something, but law is essentially where you say the same thing. So you don't mess with the Ten Commandments. Actually, the versions you get in Deuteronomy are a little different. But you're into a life and a spirit here. So when you read Galatians 5, and you read Ephesians 4 and 5, they don't say the same thing. And you read Colossians 3, they don't say the same thing. Why? Because all you need to do is get the thing going and the details will take care of themselves. So if you can do one way of stating it, let's say in Colossians, you can do the others. And you probably will without thinking about it. Now this is Christian liberty under the Spirit of God in its fruition in life. Well, I think I'll stop there. We'll take a little break and then we'll wrap it up.